بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. Welcome everybody from around the world. My name is Bilal Abdul Kareem, and this is the BAK Show, where we discuss the things which are important to you, things which are important to the Muslim Ummah, and we are uh, happy to have everybody here. We are in the 28th night of Ramadan. Wow, look at that, the 28th night. night. Things are going quickly, brothers and sisters. You know, it seemed like just yesterday we were saying, okay, Ramadan is just starting and everybody's feeling all pumped up and, you know, this is going to be the best Ramadan. Well, has it been? If it has been, alhamdulillah. If it hasn't been, listen, brothers and sisters, don't despair. What happened, happened. You've still got tonight, make tahajjud. You've got the, at least tomorrow night to make some type of uh, supplications, sincere duas and such like that so that you could finish on a strong note and then you can try to carry the momentum over after the Eid. So if it's been great, let it end great because sometimes what happens is that everybody gives all this energy and effort up until the 27th and then the 28th night, everybody's sound asleep. And uh, they're like, okay, you look, we'll just phone in the rest of Ramadan. Yeah, I know. It happens. But it's your job to make sure that this year it doesn't happen. And that's for real. One second, please. I'm having a bit of coffee here. No. All right, everybody. Um, we've got uh, some things that we're going to need to discuss here today. Um, we, but first, we are broadcasting live on YouTube and X, formerly known as Twitter. As I, as you know, I am your host, Bilal Abdul Karim, and we're broadcasting from northern Syria, from what is known as the Free Territories, which ain't quite as free as some people think it is. But don't worry, we're working on it, and that's for real. Uh, today, in our show, we're going to be discussing um, a couple of important uh, topics, like one of the topics we're going to talk about is the killing of Abu Maria Qahtani. Um, who killed him, uh, most likely? Why? Who stood to gain and benefit from his death? We'll talk about that. In addition, we're going to talk about um, uh, what's going on in Gaza. Uh, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, uh, a block of 57 nations, uh, has come out and had they've had they've got a statement regarding the attacks that the Israelis uh, pulled off on the worshippers um, at Masjid al-Aqsa uh, just yesterday. So we're going to be seeing what they had to say and if it amounts to anything. So that's where we are. Okay, brothers and sisters. Um, firstly, um, wherever you are out there and you are tuning into us. Let's hear from you. Why don't you send us a assalamu alaikum? How are you doing? What's going on? Tell us where you're um, you're uh, tuning in from. What country? And all we love to hear from you. Uh, that gets the algorithm going because there's back and forth, there's exchange, and that way more people will have an opportunity to jump in and to join in, and we can talk about what we're going to talk about here today. Now. I'm drinking coffee here. Now, why am I drinking coffee? Well, the reality of the situation is that I'm not a night person. I'm really not. I'm a guy that can be wide awake and strong and ready to go after Fadger or before Fadger. But when it starts to hit the evening times, I'm just like, <sighs> so I'm not a night person. And staying up all night uh, in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, for me, is rough. It's big time rough. So I've got to drink uh, coffee, which my body is not accustomed to. And um, so I drink a couple of cups of coffee and uh, so that I can stay up and we can do the show and we can make uh, a tahajjud. And I'm not in sujood like I saw somebody just the other day in sujood. And when everybody came up after Allahu Akbar, well, uh, he didn't come up. <laughs> he was sound asleep. So in an effort not to turn out like that, um, that's what uh, 
uh, you know, you know, that's why you're going to see me frequently doing this. This is coffee. I don't like it. It does not taste good. I am not a coffee fan, but it does what I need it to do, which is to keep me awake. Mm -hmm. Let's get started here. All right. Firstly, um, as everybody probably already knows, um, Abu Maria Kahtani um, was assassinated in his reception uh, uh, area uh, in the northern Syrian town of Sarmada, um, which is probably just about a seven-minute drive from the uh, from the Turkish border. Now, we got to give you guys a little bit of background here. Uh, Abu Maria Kahtani um, is uh, Iraqi. Uh, he was, or I should say, he was Iraqi. He was uh, born in Mosul. And he was about 46 years old. And he and Abu Muhammad Jolan have a long history together. He came over um, from Iraq with Jolani uh, on the orders of Abu Bakr Baghdadi, who was the leader of ISIS, who was killed some years ago by US forces here in Northern Syria. Um, and uh, basically, he'd been with Jolani for some time. They split for a little while, but then he came back and they were working together. So much of what you see is um, uh, of Hayat Tahrir Shem, a uh, part architect of what you see is or was um, uh, Abu Maria Kahtani. Now, Abu Maria Kahtani, as we discussed in um, a previous episode here after his uh, assassination. Um, I am being honest with you in that I do not see Abu Maria Kahtani as an Islamic figure. Um, there's been too much killing, uh, too much uh, torture, too much uh, stealing, and so on and so forth that um, I, I can't say that I see Kahtani as a religious figure. Um, and I don't think that a lot of the people who knew him personally and saw his um, uh, his po his politics that they might differ with me in that, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. Um, uh, as everybody here knows, uh, there are campaigns throughout the streets of Idlib calling for the ouster of not only Abu Muhammad Jolani but also those who are in his inner circle. Now, Kahtani ran afoul of Abu Muhammad Jolani and was arrested last year in 2023. He spent about seven months uh, in prison and he was suspected of uh, sharing uh, of, of uh, improper communications with foreign entities, or in other words, that means talking to the uh, security services of other uh, countries. Um, this is was his charge. Uh, improper communications, and so on and so forth. He spent seven months. And it, it was billed as um, a big catch, uh, right thing to do, and so on and so forth by Joe Lanny and his media wing. But then it turned out, or at least it, for some reason, he saw fit to release him, and he said that he was not guilty. And then he was released a couple of weeks ago. Now, I mentioned to quite a few people that Jolani and Kahtani would not be able to live together after that. When gangsters are uh, working together and then one imprisons the other and he lets him go, it doesn't usually turn out to be anything more than setting the stage for a confrontation. And that's exactly what took place. I believe that it was going to be either Kahtani was going to take down Jolani or Jolani was going to take down Kahtani. Um, it was rumored that Kahtani had ambitions to uh, set up a uh, protective guard um, and within the ranks of Hayat Tahrir Shem. Uh, this is what was rumored. Uh, I can't verify that 100%, but I would tell you of all the rumors that I've heard, that probably makes the most sense because he did have quite a bit of following within the ranks of Hayat Tahrir Shem. Okay, so that's the situation with Hayat, uh, with Abu Maria Kahtani. So who are the likely suspects that probably 
may have uh, contributed to his murder. Well, uh, there are more than one version in terms of his killing. One version is that um, there was a, uh, 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 an explosive device which was planted in his reception area, and that's what killed him. Another is that there was an ISIS operator who uh, embraced him and detonated the explosive. Um, so that would be, a uh, first one would be possibly Abu Muhammad Jolani, second one would be ISIS. Um, and the third uh, could be any other disgruntled um, person who was done wrong by uh, Qahtani and Hayat Tahrir Shah. The third one, Allah knows best. Well, let's talk about the first two, which is either Jolani or ISIS. We'll talk about ISIS first. Um, it was billed by uh, Ahmed Zaydan, who is a, an Al Jazeera journalist, that Qahtani is the one who broke the horn of ISIS, as if uh, Qahtani was some kind of um, fighting against extremist figure. Uh, he wasn't. He wasn't at all. That was not his proto uh, his uh, his protocol at all. Uh, these groups, which he fought against, Al Qaeda, ISIS. Um, now, whether you like these groups or you don't like these groups, one thing is real. Hayat Sahir Shah was a rival to these other groups, and they didn't want them operating in their territory. It has nothing to do with. They're against extremism and that they want to fight for the people and all that just was not the case. And don't let anybody tell you that it was because it wasn't. This was about rival groups. It was just like you'll see, you'll, you'll see the Crips and the Bloods or you'll see other groups um, vying for uh, 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 power and control over certain territories. This was the exact same way. So. Was it ISIS? It's possible. Anything is possible. ISIS no longer has the strength to control swathes of territory. However, they do have the ability to play the spoiler because at the end of the day, you only need two or three guys to be able to take down um, a, a certain uh, a person in position, provided those two or three people know what they're doing. And I believe that ISIS has more than two or three people operating in northern Syria. After having said that, I think that it is unlikely. I think that it is more likely that Abu Muhammad Jolani knew that he had to take out um, Abu Maria Qahtani. He released him from prison because after all, with the following that he had within the ranks of Hayat Tahrir Shan, it would have been very, very difficult for Abu Muhammad Jolani to get away with simply saying, well, what happened to uh, Qahtani? I don't know. He, he fell, he hit his head or something like that. I don't know. You know, we gave, we bought some chips for him and with the sandwich. It didn't agree with him, and the next thing you know, he died. I don't know what happened to him. I don't think anybody was going to buy that. So do I believe that he probably released him, knowing that he was going to probably uh, have to take him out? Probably. Uh, yeah, I, be I could believe that. I could believe that much faster than I can the ISIS narrative, which was actually pretty interesting because Jolani's media wing was pushing the ISIS narrative less than an hour after the actual attack. So how would you exactly know when the details were sketchy to begin with? It kind of reminds me back of, of, of September 11th, the day after the attack, the United States had all the pictures of the hijackers. How did that happen? That was quick. Um, sounds like it was ready-made to me, but I've always held that position and a lot knows best. The point of the matter here is, is that no, I don't um, uh, uh, believe that they, uh, that their media wings uh, or those who are, media, who are HTS friendly um, did any research or any checking. I think that they basically just got their talking points and they ran with it, or they already had the talking points. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. If there are any questions in that regard, we can talk about that. Next, let's go into um, what took place at Al-Aqsa uh, um, Masjid. Well, 
See, everybody, you have to understand something. When we talk about occupation, some people don't always understand occupation. In the, uh, uh, in the, my, in, in the Al-Aqsa area, it's under occupation. And this is Ramadan. It was the 27th night of Ramadan. And of course, the Israelis want to disrupt the uh, proceedings and the worship uh, uh, that takes place at Al-Aqsa. So uh, not only did they stop uh, uh, young men from going, some of them, uh, because they said they had improper permits. Got to understand something, brothers and sisters, a permit to go to the masjid to go and pray to Allah, that's occupation. So they stopped some of them. Some of the elderly, they said that, well, they don't have the proper permits. They stopped some of them. And they were checking IDs at the door of the masjid. How much of a deterrent is that? Again, those soldiers are not even supposed to be there as per the agreement with the Jordanians. Um, but that's never been respected for one real reason is because Jordan has no mechanism, nothing to be able to enforce any violations of their agreement um, with the Israelis. And that's the reality of the situation. And Allah knows best. They're not going to call up Washington and say, hey, look, the guys want to pray. Tell them guys to, 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 to chill. What do you think Washington's going to say? Yeah. Yeah. Who's this again? Abdullah who? The king of where? Hello? Hello? Is anybody on this line? That's the reality. And Allah knows best. Okay. So, and then the Israelis fired tear gas on the, on, on the, the worshipers. Now, after all of that, check me out, brothers and sisters. Check this out. After all of that, after everything that's going on out in Gaza, and the 27th of Ramadan, this is what takes place. Now, the Organization for Islamic uh, uh, Cooperation, which is a block of Muslim countries, 57 Muslim countries, I did not stutter. I said 57 Muslim countries participate in this uh, this block and listen to the, 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 the statement that, that comes out. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation has strongly denounced the actions of Israeli occupation forces, which prevented thousands from reaching the Al-Aqsa Mosque and engaged in direct confrontation with worshipers. The use of tear gas and poisonous gas within the mosque courtyards results in numerous injuries and arrests. These actions are seen as clear violations of international norms and human values. Wow. Okay. The organization has urged the international community to intervene and compel Israel to cease its repeated infringements on the freedom of worship and the sanctity of Al-Quds holy sites. The OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, has reiterated its call for the implementation of United Nations resolutions aimed at halting Israeli aggression against the Palestinian people. Finally, it says, furthermore, the organization renewed its appeal for ensuring the delivery of humanitarian aid to all areas of the Gaza Strip, underscoring the pressing need to alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian population amidst ongoing hostilities. Well, would you look at that? Well. Let's go back briefly and take a look. First issue is that, okay, they say there's a use of tear gas and poisonous gas within the mosque's courtyards. Okay, let me ask you a question. If a neighbor who's hostile to you got a smoke bomb and threw it into your courtyard when you had your family over and you were having a cookout, you'd be upset, wouldn't you? You'd be so upset that if you go right over there and you say, hey, you, we got to settle up. Yes or no? Of course. Well, this is the house of Allah. Better than any house that you could have. And the worshipers are the brothers and sisters of the ummah. And they stop people from coming. They're checking IDs at the door and they're harassing the worshipers and so on and so forth. And the OIC says, 
these actions are seen as clear violations of international norms and human values. It goes on to say that the OIC has reiterated its call for the implementation of UN resolutions aimed at halting Israeli aggressions against the Palestinian people. Well, they ain't been listening up until now. And do you think that your condemnation is going to do anything? Now, people are going to sit there and say, come on, be that. hold up, man. Don't be like that, man. The brothers at the OIC, they're trying to do something good. But you know what? They're weak. They're in a situation of weakness. Come on, man. You know, you know, just be cool. This is the last 10 days of Ramadan. I said, listen, let's keep it real. You're boasting 57 countries. They've got a collective gross domestic product of $27 trillion. It's, it, 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 that includes the Gulf states and the oil wealth, the gas wealth, and so on and so forth. And all of the military equipment that the Muslims paid for with the natural gas and, natu and the oil that comes out of the ground of the Muslim countries, the Muslims paid for. That ain't the personal property of Muhammad bin Salman and his pops. That's not the personal property of uh, Tamim out there in Qatar. These are only the trustees of it, or supposed to be. Now, um, with all of that in mind, the biggest response that the Muslims could give with an attack on the third holiest site in the most revered site in Islam, Masjid al-Aqsa, is a condemnation and you calling on the international community? International community is going to be sitting there saying, yo, hold up, check this out. Um, what you calling on us for? What you going to do? Now, if you don't have a plan to go and do anything and you're just saying, well, you know what? I figured I could just, I, I'd tell you and you could like, you know, talk to the Israel. No, no? Okay. All right. I'll see you next massacre. That's the reality. The reality of the situation is that the international community isn't going to even look at this uh, seriously because if the people who are writing it, then you don't have enough gumption, enough energy, enough conviction to actually do something, 57 nation block, and you coming to us? Guys, let's get serious. That's what the international community would have to tell you. So it just wraps up here by saying, furthermore, the organization renewed its appeal for ensuring the delivery of humanitarian aid to all areas of the Gaza Strip. They're not going to listen to you because why? What are you going to do about it? This is, and I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, don't fall for uh, uh, these fancy titles, International Qu uh, uh, Court of Justice, uh, International Criminal Court, um, uh, human rights organizations. Brothers and sisters, we are now living in a planetary jungle. If you've got energy, you've got weapons, you've got influence, you've got whatever it is that you have, then then that's what's going to be your currency. Not writing another letter to the Secretary General of the United Nations. That's not going to do you any good because there's a concerted effort to make sure that those efforts fail. So if you're not willing to fight, and fighting takes many different uh, 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 forms. It could be militarily. It could be politically. It could be economically. It could be many different ways. But if you're not prepared to do one of the main three or all three, then you've got nothing. Sit down and shut up. I'm sorry to be so harsh, but that's the reality of the situation. Everybody should know and understand that. No more letters to the ICC, ICJ, uh, HRW, and such like that. I'm not saying don't, don't do it, but I'm just saying don't expect any result to come out of it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. All right. Let's take a look and see what's important to you, your, your questions here. We've got here Shane Karun T who says, what difference are they making in Syria? Um, uh, Shane Karun, I'm really sorry, but I don't understand who they are. Are you talking about HTS? Are you talking about 
uh, Kohtari who was killed. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, in town is here. Uh, but do re respond and I will uh, take your question, inshallah, before you get off. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Have a blessed night, brother. And you too. Amin. Amin. A uh, Lincoln Throp said, uh, Kahtani was a snitch and a munafik. Um, I believe that my opinion is that you were right. Um, I do believe that. You see, brothers and sisters, that's like somebody coming now. Why did Qahtani leave a Hayat Tahrir Shan? Because he got locked up. He didn't walk away because he said to Jolani, yo, Jolani, where's the justice? Yo, I'm out of here. I'm not going to be a part of this. He didn't say that. He didn't say, yo, Jolani, them prisoners that you got in there pinned up, the ones that died, we had to bury them in the graveyard. I ain't with that. No, that's not why he left. When he says, uh, when Joe Lanny was doing the monopoly on essential items like flour, sugar, fuel that nobody else can import into Idlib except him. And therefore, he can set his own prices, which were traditionally higher than in the areas that I'm in. And we're right next door. But what can anybody do about it? Because he controls the, the, the flow of goods. He controls the uh, uh, the markets and he controls the security forces to lock up any malcontents. I digress. The point here is is that um, when all of this was going on, Kahtani was not the one that was sitting there saying, "Joe Lanny, I ain't having it. Either you going to reform or I'm out." He's been with Joe Lanny all these years, and he only left the group because he got locked up. That was it. That's the reality of the situation. Anybody doesn't like that. I get it. But that's what happened. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. M.A. is in the house and says, Assalamu alaikum, Akhi. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, do you think Iran is capable of dealing with Israel and will America defend Israel against Iran? All right. That's going to open up a topic here, which is, do I think that Iran is going to respond? Um, Iran traditionally is given to lots of rhetoric. Uh, their number one boy, which was Qasem Soleimani, was killed, I believe, four years ago um, during the Trump administration. Now, Qasem Soleimani, amongst the government of Israel and amongst uh, a good portion of the population of the Iranian people, they liked him. They thought he was cool. And... Uh, when he was killed, the Iranians said, ah, ah, we will respond at a time of our choosing. Well, you know, it's four years later and we ain't seen that response yet. Now, some in, in, in circles, my, uh, uh, anal uh, uh, analytical circles might say, wait a minute, some of their proxies um, have been bombing or, or attacking U.S. forces and so on and so forth. Well, six weeks ago, that stopped anyway, or at least if we're talking about the Iraqi, uh, um, um, uh, uh, Iranian-backed militias. But the point of the matter here is, is that, look, the Israelis came right up to your face with your wife standing there, metaphorically speaking, of course, smacked you in the face, smacked your wife, spat in your, in your eye, and pushed your little girl down in the mud, and they said, what you going to do about it? Now, this has happened on quite a few occasions. The Israelis have bombed uh, Iranian positions and Iranian-backed militia forces here in Syria, and the Iranians haven't done anything. Now, from what we have seen, the Iranians are moving some anti- uh, 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 aerial defense uh, batteries and capabilities to um, um, all around the country. Uh, the rhetoric coming out of Tehran has been nothing short of strong and forceful and decisive. They've been saying that the, uh, uh, that the Israelis are going to pay. Um, one of the statements was that the Israelis um, have uh, committed suicide and all. Um, are the Israelis concerned about it? I think that they are concerned about it because it is possible 
because in these types of affairs, you never know if they have crossed the line. Do I think that the Iranians are going to directly attack Israel? No, I don't. Because they risk that America will get involved um, in the conflict. And if America gets involved in the conflict, that's going to be bad news for Iran. Unless, unless the Iranians have some type of guarantees, if you want to call it that, from Russia or China that they're going to uh, 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 somehow aid and assist the Iranians. It is possible. Taiwan has been a long thorn in the side of, of the Chinese, but are the Chinese ready to jump into a military uh, 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 fight with the Americans? Well, some people say, well, China's got a lot of money. This is true. China's got a lot of uh, military assets, which is true. But if you look at it, just so you understand uh, the, the, the context here, China isn't ready militarily to go straight up with America, period. Um, they're not. Number one, if you look at a map, there are mil U.S. military bases all around China, completely surrounding China. That's why the Chinese don't sleep good at night. The other issue is that um, the Chinese, uh, 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 if we want to look at it at aircraft carriers, the Chinese last year or the, the, or the end of 2022, they put to sea their first uh, Chinese built aircraft carrier into the waters um, and uh, to boost their naval capabilities. That's a great achievement. They've got their own aircraft carrier out there that they built themselves. Got it? Good. Okay. The Americans have 11. The Chinese aren't ready for a straight up fight. They're not. And the Americans know that. But perhaps if the Russians are willing to throw a span in the monkey, uh, to throw a, a, a monkey wrench in the works, it is possible that they could cause lots of problems for America and make America think twice before coming to the aid of the Israelis. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, well, the reality of the situation um, is that uh, America has given to the Ukrainians a great deal of weaponry and, uh, and, uh, and ammunition. Now, bear in mind, America has plenty, but there were lawmakers just last year that were complaining that their stockpiles are being depleted because of Ukraine. Now, nobody really took that seriously because America didn't have any natural enemies that they would need large stockpiles of uh, ammunition and weaponry, um, not so much to defend itself, but for its worldwide expansion or maintenance of their global empire. But now we may be looking at something different because if the Iranians decide to say, I right, bet we ain't taking it no more. And we know that the Israelis have used a lot to smash Gaza. We've been stockpiling our stuff. We can uh, take these guys on. If America comes, uh, starts bringing um, assets to the region, and maybe the Chinese or the Russian move some military assets to the region, nobody wants a global war. But the Iranians are going to have to show that, look, yo, we a player here. You know what I'm saying? I'm a man. You can't do me just any old kind of way. And all this talk and rhetoric, it's, it's, it's tired. It's, it's, it's old. So um, we're going to find out in the next couple of days or weeks or so on and so forth, um, you know, what the Iranians have. I'm not convinced that they've got a stomach for this kind of fight, nor do I think they have the diplomatic capability to convince the Chinese or the Russians to back them. So um, I think that things are going to go on pretty much just as it always has been, and Allah knows best. Okay, we've got Nas94, my man, who's here, says, I remember back in the day, ISIS hated Qahtari so much and saw him as a traitor and were salivating when they thought they had him surrounded in Deir Azur. Ha! And lo and behold, 
he worked his way out of Deir Azur, which was surrounded not only by ISIS, but also by the regime. Now, how did he do that? Up until this day, nobody knows. <laughs> very, very interesting. It goes on to say, seems very unlikely Jolani killed him as he has been pictured kissing his dead body. Ah, uh, come on, ah, uh, come on, ah. Uh, you know, work with me here just a little bit. Um, of course he was. But that doesn't mean anything. That means nothing. How many killers have gone to the funerals of the people that they've killed? Gangsters go to the funerals of the people that they killed because they want everybody to see that they're there. Yeah, I'm sad. That's the way that they operate. So I'm going to tell you, brother, that doesn't mean anything. That means less than zero. And I'm not discounting what you're saying. I don't want my forceful language to maybe to put you off because I don't mean that. But I want to say in no uncertain terms that um, this, that his saying, oh, Kartani, and such like that and all, um, that was, that, that, that didn't mean anything because that's just how the gangster life is. That's, that's what they do. They've got a personal profile uh, um, that the inner circle knows and they've got a public profile. And that's real. All right. In town says, how can we explain the video circulating of the room when Abu Maria was killed? Where the guy in the video showing the lefts of the body parts of the suicide bomber. What you saw were the body parts of a victim of the blast. Who says it was the suicide bomber? Only thing I can say is that those are the remnants of a dead body. But then I have to ask myself a question. How did a cat with an explosive device get inside the tent anyway? How did that happen? No security? Abu, Muhammad, uh, Abu Maria Qahtani has no security around him? That doesn't make sense to me. If they have anything, if you, and you've got a suicide vest on, and when you're coming in to go see the top man, there's nobody there that's saying and everything, we got to pat this one down, we don't know who he is? Is that for real? I don't see that as credible because all of these guys have security. And you and your security is so uh, is so beat up, lazy that individuals and at least one individual with a suicide vest can walk right into the main tent, walk right up to the main guy, and what detonate a vest. I could understand if that happened in the marketplace, if it happened in the masjid, or it happened in a public place, but this was not a public place. This was his inner chambers where he was receiving people um, uh, who were coming uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to visit him. And there's no security? Nah, man, nah, I ain't buying that. I ain't buying that at all. Especially knowing the way that these guys roll and how they operate. They had security there. There's no way in the world. Because, all right, so you're walking through security and you got your, your suicide vest on. And somebody says, hey, what are you doing there? Do you understand what I'm saying? Come on, guys. Uh, I don't see it like that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, next up. Assalamu alaikum, Bilal. Walaikum salam. Walaikum what is the best advice you would give in having high iman in the West and having your du'as answered and being close to Allah and overcoming sins and desires? The Qur'an. The Qur'an. Read it every day. If you don't speak Arabic, just take yourself a basic Arabic class so that you can read the Qur'an in Arabic. The way things are these days, you can read the ayat in Arabic even if you don't understand it and then just scroll down on your telephone and the translation is right there. Guys, the Quran is the, you wanna stop being afraid? You want to stop 
um, uh, doing a lot of the bad deeds that you're doing, you want the motivation to do the things that Allah loves, the Quran. If you've got a lot of problems in your life, read the stories of Musa alayhi salam, who Musa was always in some type of difficulty. How did he deal with it? What did he do? And his difficulties were more difficult than the people who were here because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries the people according to their iman. And his iman was greater than yours was, than yours is, I should say. So I would tell you, ah, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be something, uh, 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 you know, um, with a lot of spice in it. Read the Quran every day. Don't let a day go by. Got to have it. It's, it's got to be like that fix. You see what I'm saying? Even if you're only going to do a page or two a day, read it with the English translation. It's cool. Huh? No problem. I myself, I've been Muslim for, uh, uh, for what, 27, 28 years. And sometimes I'll come across an ayat and I'll be like, mm, I'm not sure what this word means. And I'll go to the English translation. Why not? You see what I'm saying? That will make your bond strong with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah. Now, um, Nas94 is here. Um, he says, Joe Lanny should have listened to Baghdadi and merged with ICE, with uh, the Islamic State of Iraq, so that he could have had more control of ISIS and prevent them from going on the rampage in Syria and ruining the revolution. They were going to ruin it anyway, because look at the individuals that were there. A uh, person like Baghdadi, who's given to takfir, and then you have Joe Lanny, who's little more than a gangster trying to wear the cloak of Islam. So at the end of the day, whoever merged with whoever, it wasn't going to make a difference because the foundation of these individuals is cracked. It's broken. And no good was going to come from them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, okay, we're going to wrap this thing up. Um, okay, uh, here's a, an interesting one. We've got uh, Daniel's PSA says, Brother Bilal, do you think Idlib would be better under the control of the NFL, Ahrar, Isham? Um, referring more to the groups, the Turkish back groups um, uh, uh, in the Euphrates Shield areas and such like that. Uh, no, I don't. But then you're going to sit there and say, okay, we'll just leave Joel Annie there. No, that is not an option. I do think that a shura of technocrats and religious figures, known religious figures, who have no affiliation to Hayat Tahrir would be given the uh, mandate to run the affairs of Idlib for a temporary period of time, and there would be elections for, their, uh, for the entire leadership package. Now, I did not say democracy, because democracy and elections are not one and the same. Elections are a component of democracy, but elections are sure where you're taking the opinion of the people who are being governed over. Um, who do they want? Now, I like the idea of elections, and I'm going to tell you why. Because I've been here in this part of the world for, uh, for more than 20 years, and you just have one dictator after another coming to the table, and they promise no one anything. They don't tell you they're going to do this. They don't going to tell you they're going to do that. They just get the job, and it's just like, what? I got my security people who are around me. Nobody can touch me except for the people who are um, a, a part of this apparatus. So little uh, Fatima and little Khadija and everything. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, whatever. You know, I'm, I'm the kingpin now. And once they get to be the leader, you never get rid of them unless they end up being killed or overthrown in some type of bloody coup or something like that or palace uprising. So I'm saying is that I'm tired of all of that. I want to see that if somebody says, hey, listen, I'm going to, I, I'm, I think I could benefit the people in being the next leader. And they say, okay. And the people say, okay, bet. No problem. What's going to be your program? And he's got to actually tell the people something. He's got to actually say, well, you know what? I want to liberate Masjid al-Aqsa. And I want to um, eradicate all suffering 
in the Idlib area in the span of 30 days. Okay, people say, okay, that's nice. We like that. How are you going to do that? Uh, uh, okay, thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Okay, you know, don't vote for that cat. But because so many of these people, when they come to power and you sit and you listen to them and you say, hey, man, does this guy have a high school education? Sorry, guys. It's dismal over here. So but when somebody actually has to make a case that they're the guy to back in these territories, I like that because then we can get rid of some of the charlatans. And look, and we put it like this, anybody that doesn't want to have Islam, anybody that wants to play the international game, which the Gazans will tell you, you're not going to win it, okay? If you're not going the Sharia route, out the door. That's the reality. That has to be our constitution, our commitment, because anything other than that, talking about the United Nations, they might help us out. Some money is going to come from the IMF. Uh, um, they might help us out. Or we got to make sure we do things in the proper way so that we make sure that Human Rights Watch is going to be there for us. And, and Amnesty International is going to be there for us. Now, those are some pretty decent institutions, but they have no power. The only thing they can do is name and shame. And as you can see with the Israelis, that's not enough. And even with the Russians and regarding Bashar al-Assad, who killed a million Syrians, that's not enough. So the reality of the situation is hold on to your principles, hang tough, believe in Allah, implement what is in the Quran, and you're going to get yourself your own state. Just ask the Taliban. All right. Um, let's, all right, we are going to wrap this thing up. Um, case would be like a visa. Um, all right, everybody. Um, okay, uh, last question is we'll take here, uh, Zachariah, who says, Sheikh Abdul Razak and Mahdi issued statements calling on the youth to protect the Mashayikh after Qahtani's assassination. Do you think he is correct in expecting even, even further trouble against the ulama? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. No question about it. You see, brothers and sisters, people like to employ gangsters because gangsters are easy to manipulate. You make sure that they're uh, stuffed with cash and women and give them a flow so they can bring in more money, they're cool. They ain't going to give you a hard time. But when you add a religious element into it, oh, uh, this is troublesome because this guy has ideals. He's actually standing for something. Money we have. But to give him a seat at the table because he's fighting for the good of the Syrian people, no, we're not interested in that. And that's for real. And so I'm telling, I'm telling you, as a student of history, absolutely, that, that, that the Mashiach who are serious about making change, I think that the youth should be trying to protect them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. All right, y'all. We got to wrap this up. Um, and okay, um, look. One more. All right. Um, yeah, okay. We're going to leave that here for right now. Look, guys, uh, Jazakallah khair for joining us. We will be back tomorrow night on the 29th night of Ramadan. I am your host, Bilal Abdul Kareem. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.